Welcome to the Resilient Training Lab Podcast. Welcome back to the Resilient Training Lab Podcast. We're going to continue our Get to Know Your Coaches segment today. I'm joined by Ryan Van, a uh, physical therapist for Resilient Training Lab and owner of Barbell Doc Performance and PT. So what's up, Ryan? Not much, man. How's it going with you? It's going good, man. Yeah, we've been back in the gym for about a month now. Ryan's been coaching with us on the floor. It seems like he's getting to know everybody great. So how's things going on the floor for you? Yeah, it's been good so far. I mean, I joined up at a weird time where I just started programming right before all this stuff happened. And then it kind of stopped me from doing any in-person coaching. And now uh, picking up after gyms open in like mid-June, it's been good. It's definitely nice to get back in, start coaching people in person, meeting everybody, all that sort of stuff. So it's been a good time. Yeah, it's not an easy time to fill your schedule and you seem to be keeping yourself pretty busy. So that's awesome. Yeah, it's going well so far. So today we're going to just run through Ryan's history, man. So I'll let you take it away. Probably going to start with you know, how active you were as a kid and we'll start to look at what your first training experiences were like and how that molded you into the clinician that you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So I was kind of first introduced to weightlifting training, strength training, stuff like that by my mom, who's actually a personal trainer. She's been personal trainer pretty much my whole life. So once I was like, I don't know, 11 or 12 years old, she had me in the gym just teaching me how to lift weights, kind of going over technique for different lifts, ingraining good habits. And then as a freshman in high school, I joined the wrestling team. And For those of you who don't know much about wrestling, it's a weight class based sport. So when I went into high school, I weighed like 107 naturally. So I was tiny and I wrestled in 112 pound weight class and never had to cut weight, which was awesome. But first year I was terrible. I was like scrawny, little. I didn't know much about wrestling, got my butt kicked all season long. And then I decided that I wanted to actually hit the weight room, build up some strength, just develop those physical qualities as I was learning the sport in order to perform better in the following season. So that year I started really actually doing some like dedicated weightlifting, dedicated strength training. And then from there, I've just kind of continued with it. It's been in my life for pretty much as long as I can remember. So it's just one of those things that I enjoy doing. It's part of my routine. And if I don't do it, then I just feel really off. So, so when you started uh, looking to gain strength for wrestling, Is that something that your mom helped you with? Did you continue to go with her through that time period? Yeah, she did. Um, So being like a personal trainer, she wasn't necessarily like a strength coach per se. She was more into the like bodybuilding physique part of it. But she did have like a foundational knowledge of weightlifting and strength training that she used to help me develop that quality and like pursue my goals. In high school, we had kind of like a little strength coach that helped us out a little bit, but The school's focus was on football, so we didn't really get that much love in the weight room. (laughs) Yeah, the football are the golden kids. Yeah, exactly. We mostly got like prescribed like lower intensity circuit training based stuff, which looking back on it now and like having the knowledge of how to actually program and coach for certain outcomes, certain sports, it definitely wasn't the best thing for us. But those initial exposures into strength training, weightlifting really helped develop my interest in it. And then that led to me doing my own research, my own reading, kind of further my knowledge in school and outside of school. And that's what really helped me kind of speed things along and get to where I am now. What were some of your sources? I know that's kind of the golden era of bodybuilding.com and T Nation. So what were you reading back then? Dude, when I was in like high school and undergrad, it was like a lot of T Nation, like you said, I thought that. (laughs) initially i thought that a lot of that information was like good sound information because it sounded like it could be plausible and all that stuff but once you eventually like start reading actual strength and conditioning literature and research you quickly realize that that stuff is not the best stuff out there like a lot of the stuff that we find on the internet so (laughs) yeah that was dude those those articles were like clickbait before clickbait was a thing it was always like five ways to grow your lats eight ways you're (laughs) you know not training your deadlift hard enough it was terrible. I remember reading stuff like that. And then like they would promote their velocity diet and all these crazy, like different diets and training routines. And it it just wasn't good information. But when you first start out, you don't really know better. And as you read more and more, learn more and more, you quickly realize what 
is good information, what isn't necessarily as good information. So it's a learning process that you go through just like with school and treating people from like a physical therapy standpoint. So it ended up being all good and everything like that. Fortunately, the age bracket that tends to find that stuff to read can make progress regardless of what they're doing, just because, you know, they're getting older and stronger anyway. So exactly. I didn't miss out on too much. You <laughs> learned when it, you learned before it was necessary. Yeah. So you're 107 pounds soaking wet. You're lifting weights. You get better at wrestling. Did it work? Yeah. I mean, once I got my butt kicked that whole first season, I really dedicated a lot of time to like strength training and practicing the sport. So I would do like out of season um, practice. I was part of like a wrestling club in Connecticut and through actually trying to eat a lot more and focus on regularly lifting, I was able to gain like 20 or 30 pounds over the course of the next year and a half. And during that time, my strength went up and everything like that. So I ended up helping out quite a bit. I did a lot better the following seasons and uh, I was pretty happy with it overall. Is that the only sport that you were playing at this time? That was the only scholastic sport. I also did like martial arts, uh, jujitsu, a little bit of boxing, stuff like that. But wrestling is the only thing that I ever did for school. You're just all combat sports guy. No, no bats, no balls. Just no. I mean, I would hit play like baseball and football, like recreationally with my friends for fun, but never competitively in school or anything like that. Yeah, all, all combat sports for some reason. <laughs> and I mean, that's at a time where. It might be hard to imagine now, but combat sports weren't that popular up until, at least for me, when I was in in high school, but like maybe more towards the end when like UFC started to get bigger and, you know, everybody was wearing those tap out shirts. I have to admit, <laughs> I wore a tap out shirt at one point in my life. Yeah, so did I. I don't want to revisit that point. That was terrible. <laughs> so what, uh, what was the attraction to wrestling for you that or all, I guess all combat sports, right? How did you kind of fall yeah. in love with those? I mean, my both my parents were always pretty adamant that my brother, brothers and I at least try out one or two different sports to see what we like just for, because I've seen playing sports is good from like a discipline standpoint and like just getting in some physical exercise and all that stuff. So when I was like five, they had me and Evan just try like a karate class at like a local dojo and Evan and I both really liked it and we kind of stuck with it up until I was like 18. So yeah, we did martial arts from five to 18. And then I think just already having some background in like a combat sport like that kind of drew me to wrestling anyways. It was something that I thought would transition pretty well. So I talked to the couple of wrestling coaches and one of them was also a teacher at my school who I knew. So I went to him, talked to him a little bit, tried it out and I really loved the sport and ended up sticking with it. Yeah. I can't imagine two brothers not wanting to beat the crap out of each other at some point. Right. So yeah, good times, man. You guys got to do it almost professionally for (laughs) 13 years. (laughs) Exactly. Now, is there anything else in, I guess your workout history before you left high school? Did you have an inkling that you wanted to be a physical therapist at this point? Did you you know, maybe experience an injury that you had to go to rehab for? Or what was your outlook on your future in high school? If, you know, if any high schooler actually has any idea what their future holds? Yeah. So when I was a freshman on the team, I had sustained a mild-ish shoulder injury that resulted in a little bit of like ongoing laxity in my shoulder. But I just continued to do strength training and practice on sport, and it was fine for the first two years. And then in my junior year, about midway through the season, I suffered a traumatic rotator cuff and labral tear on my right shoulder. So I went and underwent a rotator cuff and labral repair, had like five or six months of PT afterwards. And while going to PT, I just found it really interesting. I had always obviously liked the exercise part of it and then seeing how could how you could use exercise to help treat people in pain and after surgery and deal with these painful conditions it really kind of piqued my interest so the first time I went to PT I got 
really interested in. I thought I might want to pursue that further. So I ended up doing a bunch of um, shadowing with various clinics around my town, including the one that I did my rehab at. And I ended up really liking it. So I decided to kind of then and there that I wanted to go to PT school. So I was lucky in the fact that I'd known pretty much early in high school what I wanted to do for a career. And then I applied to a bunch of different PT schools and ended up settling on Quinnipiac. So you, you were shadowing in high school? Mm-hmm. Wow, that's, that's awesome. That's a pretty big move for somebody in high school to recognize that they, you know, enjoy something so much that they wanted to shadow. That's, that's awesome. I talked to a lot of physical therapists and they said that obviously PT school is a competitive environment. So anything that you can do to try to stand out from the rest of the applicants, you should absolutely do. So shadowing just happened to be one of the few things that I could do as like a high school student to actually do that. Yeah. So now having been through PT school and practicing and having several or, well, I don't know how many hundreds of people you've treated, but looking back on that experience that you went through with your surgery and your rehab experience in physical therapy, do you feel that you were handled appropriately? Yeah, I do. I mean, luckily the clinic that I went to wasn't they weren't afraid to treat athletes how they should be treated and handled and to actually like load them well and things like that. So I had really good experiences with physical therapy from the get-go. And that is, I think that's one of the reasons that really drew me to PT because if I had gone to a physical therapist or a clinic who was very like anti-strength training or weightlifting or things like that, it might have turned me away from the profession, but I was lucky in that sense. Is there anything that sticks out from your treatment that still to this day you appreciate or it kind of reminds you of why you do what you do? Yeah. So them knowing that I was a competitive wrestler, they kind of really tailored their treatment towards that. So any chance that they could do to make like the drills that I was doing more sport specific, they absolutely would. And then just they really placed an emphasis on actually gaining back enough full strength in my shoulder to actually get me back to sport safely. So they weren't afraid to like go past like the blue or red TheraBand and like the one or two pound weights. Like they progressed me with all the weight that they could in the clinic and had me actually more training than anything else to a, once we got to a certain point in my rehab process. Hmm. So you brought up something that we talk about. This is more just on the, the training and educating side, but you mentioned that they made your, exercise is more sports specific. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people equate that to, you know, standing on a BOSU ball and pretending that you're swinging a golf club. (laughs) And that's quote unquote sports specific. So what were some things that they did to make wrestling specific exercises for you? Yeah. So they would have me do a lot of like ground-based drills. So obviously wrestling is a predominantly ground-based sport. You're not standing up for most of the match. So they would have me do different kind of like wrestling specific movements, like different forms of bridges. They would try to like emulate different takedowns and things like that. So anything that they could do to actually like work the movements and the specific like physical qualities of my sport, they would do. Awesome. So high school, Ryan shadows PT after going through rehab and surgery, shoulders feeling good. How does your senior wrestling season go? And then what does it look like with that transition into college? Yeah, so senior wrestling season was kind of weird. Before I had entered that season, I was doing preseason training. And I think about a month before the season actually started, I had went out with a bunch of friends for another friend's surprise birthday dinner. And unfortunately, all 12 or 13 of us ended up getting food poisoning. And then... That kind of (laughs) transitioned to a rough three days that we were all pretty sick. And I was still feeling kind of weird after that time, but I just figured it was due like the food poisoning, losing like five, 10 pounds when you're already pretty light. So I went to preseason training and then I had like a cut on my arm that just wouldn't stop bleeding. I, I didn't really think anything of it. So I went to practice, went home, showered, went to bed, all that stuff, woke up in the morning. And then I walked downstairs and my mom was like, what the hell happened to you? And I, I had no idea what she was talking about. So I looked in the mirror and I just had like black bruises all over. And it 
ended up turning out that I had developed kind of like an autoimmune condition as a result of the food poisoning in which my immune system would attack my platelets and kind of kill them off. So I had really low platelet numbers for a while, which increased my bleeding risk, but it would, it would fluctuate like day to day. So I had to go and get blood drawn at Manchester Memorial Hospital every morning that I was practicing or competing. So I ended up missing probably like half of my wrestling season my senior year due to like platelet issues. And then afterwards, it was still affecting me for a while. And then probably halfway through college, it kind of just cleared up on its own. So when I could practice and compete in wrestling my senior year, it went really well. And then obviously on the days that I couldn't, it was kind of lousy. So it would have probably been a lot better without that. But at that point, that was out of my hands. So that's pretty wild. Um, yeah. So, just so I understand correctly, when you would go to Manchester Memorial Hospital to have your blood drawn, they were just looking at how many platelets or what your platelet level was, and if it was high enough, you were allowed to wrestle. Yeah, exactly. So, with wrestling being like a very high contact sport, they wanted my plate levels to be about a hundred thousand per unit of blood that they were drawing, and like. When I was first diagnosed with that condition, it was as low as 3,000 per unit of blood, which is like dangerously low. So because of that and with those daily fluctuations, I ended up missing about half that senior season. Wow. That's really unfortunate. Yeah. Is wrestling something that you continued with once you made it to college? Uh, a little bit. When I was at Quinnipiac, they didn't have a competitive or a competitive team or like a club for wrestling. So I would kind of independently train with some of the guys that I was on the high school team with. And we would do just independent tournaments throughout like Massachusetts and a couple other states. And we did that for a little while, which was awesome. It was a lot of fun. But once I got into grad school, that kind of took up all of my free time. So I would only really study, did school and still weight train like three or four days a week. And that was about it. So I had to cut wrestling out at that point, unfortunately. So once you're at Quinnipiac, it's a six year DPT program. Yeah. So it's changed a couple of times since I went there. When I went there, it was three and a half years for your bachelor's and then another three for your DPT. So it was like six and a half in total. But then after those six and a half didactic years, you had to do your last two clinicals, which were each three months. So it ended up being about seven years. And that's still standard today for a lot of PT schools, right? Yeah. Four years for undergrad, three years for the DPT. Yeah, I feel like, I'm not sure the exact split of the programs, but there's a good split between like seven-year schools and like a six-year more accelerated program. Gotcha. So as you're heading through... Uh, I guess what would be considered your undergrad, right? If you're finishing it in the first three and a half years, mm -hmm. what does your training look like? Are you continuing to try and educate yourself more outside of your classes on strength training principles? And as an undergrad, do you feel that you were adequately prepared for uh, your, your graduate years once you hit the physical therapy program? Yeah. So in school, I was I was training consistently like four days a week. So I would typically do like an upper lower split where I would hit both areas twice a week. And I found that to be like pretty time effective because I didn't, while I want to be like in the gym every single day, it just wasn't practical from a logistic standpoint. And I do feel like I was adequately, adequately prepared for my graduate years at QU. They have a really good program there and I have nothing but good things to say about it. So I felt very lucky with the education that I got. As far as kind of continuing my coaching and like strength and conditioning education, when I was in graduate school there, we obviously went through like the exercise prescription courses and stuff like that. But that was very much more focused on not necessarily like strength and conditioning training, more so like your typical PT rehab type stuff that you would typically think of. So I knew that that wasn't the extent of the exercise knowledge that I wanted. So I did a bunch of my own reading of various textbooks like the CSCS prep book and things like that to help further my understanding of actual like programming and strength and conditioning and those other principles that you typically don't get in a PT school setting. And then I guess we can just transition right to, to PT school. So 
how did your first year go? What was your first year covering? Like what kind of materials? And uh, did you, was it everything that you were expecting, right? Because you had been, you had had your eyes on PT school for probably four or five years at this point. Yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty similar to what I was expecting. The way that QU broke up their curriculum is each year of your three years of PT school, you would do some like cardiopulmonary, some musculoskeletal, some neuro, and then you have a couple of other classes in there, like different labs, cadaver dissection, stuff like that. So it, it was pretty similar to what I was thinking it would be. The more like exercise focused stuff kind of left me a little bit lacking just because I knew how much more there was to programming and coaching movement and exercise. So that was really the only thing that I felt wasn't quite up to par because I feel like if, if you're going into that sort of curriculum without any former knowledge of like programming or strength and conditioning, then when you get out into the clinic, you might not be as prepared to actually treat people of higher levels or properly progress them through their programming. And that's why you see a lot of these like different memes about just really low load exercises being used in PT, like the whole three sets of 10 for everything. Everything's like banded, really lightweight, stuff like that. And I knew that that wasn't necessarily how it should go. So I wanted to make sure that I was doing my own reading and learning on the side so that I wouldn't fall into that sort of rut when I did get out of school. Just to reiterate, you learned a lot of low level exercises, but maybe if somebody more advanced or somebody stronger came in, there wasn't as much emphasis on teaching you and the other students how to progress them to a meaningful level. Yeah, absolutely. So when I was at QU for our exercise stuff, we never really covered things like actual squatting, deadlifting, pressing, other real like bang for your buck compound type movements. It was more like rotatory exercises for your shoulders and rotator cuff, hip stability, ankle stability, stuff like that. So I feel like if you do get somebody who's higher level or you have to eventually progress somebody past those exercises with the education on exercise training that we got, you might not necessarily be prepared for that. But it's it's one of those things that a lot of PT schools have been getting better at, even like with Quinnipiac having um, Eric Lagoy there. He's teaching an awesome course there, and he's really helping to bridge that gap for the other students who might not necessarily have either known about these, this other side of training and programming or just haven't yet had access to that sort of information. Yeah, and you know, like you had kind of hinted at, it's not a problem with just Quinnipiac. It was a very large scale issue that is very complex to tackle, right? But uh, for those of you who do know Eric, Eric teaches at Quinnipiac, and I, I don't know the name of his course, but it, it is exercise prescription related. And yep. Eric's very good at getting people strong and using heavier weights. And Paul is evidence of that. <laughs> Absolutely. So awesome, man. So you know, what are you looking at year two of PT school? Are you starting to think about maybe an area of practice that really interests you? Or, you know, what is your outlook on like, I'm thinking of clinicals in year three coming up, and maybe what you're looking to try and expose yourself to? Yeah, so the way that the curriculum there worked was after your first year of actual PT school, you did like a clinical rotation each summer afterwards. And then you have those two long ones after your didactic work is completely finished. So I was lucky. I always kind of knew that I wanted to do like the outpatient orthopedic type physical therapy where some just has a general injuries, a general pain condition. They come in um, and get treated there. It wasn't like hospital based work or neuro based PT or anything like that. So most of my clinicals were in the outpatient orthopedic setting, which is what I knew that I wanted to do kind of from the get-go. And then I did have one acute care hospital-based rotation, which was actually very rewarding. I learned a lot from it. It was a lot better than I thought it would, but I knew that I didn't want to work in a hospital system out of school. So I always had my eyes focused on outpatient orthopedics, working with the general population in that sort of manner. Is that just because that's what you experienced when you went through your shoulder surgery and yeah, exactly. That it's it's what I went through. It's what I really liked. And it's what allowed me to best 
kind of combine strength and conditioning aspects with the physical therapy side of it. So if we were to consider, let's say, you know, we take you, somebody who's interested in, like you just said, outpatient ortho, and that might look like prescribing exercises to continue to get people stronger until they're, you know, fully competent back in whatever positions and demands that they need. What are some other areas of physical therapy that might be that the average person might not think of when they think of physical therapists, right? Like what does a neurophysical therapist look like or, or something that, again, I might not even be aware of? Yeah. So there's a bunch of different clinical settings for PTs. Kind of like we said, there's acute care in the hospital. So when people are in the hospital with longer lasting illnesses and they get like deconditioning, deconditioned, you'll often have PT work with them to get them up, get them moving, exercising, and reduce that um, hospital-based deconditioning. You can also work in the neuro setting where you're working with a lot of people who have had strokes or spinal cord injuries or other injuries of that manner. You can do home health PT where you're going into actual people's homes if they're housebound, um, not able to actually get out into the community. And there's a bunch of kind of different settings like that. And they each come with their own unique set of skills that you need to be able to apply and their own challenges. And for me, my skill set and my interests fit the outpatient orthopedic setting the best. So I figured that that would be the best fit for me. What skills are those that align with outpatient ortho? Uh, I think the general, more so like strength focused exercise and working with the type of injuries that I want to work with. So being a fairly like lifelong lifter and athlete, I knew that I really wanted to focus on helping that population of people. And the best way to do that is working in the outpatient orthopedic setting. You don't see really a lot of like athletes coming through the hospital systems or neuro PT unless they have some sort of very severe traumatic injury or something like that. So the population that I want to work with most was in that orthopedic setting. And now in that orthopedic setting and with resilient, you know, we talk about this all the time that People need to be challenging themselves with load in the gym in order to get stronger, constantly drive adaptation and progress. So do those same principles hold true in those other areas of physical therapy that you had mentioned? Yeah, they still do. I mean, no matter no matter what setting you're in, if you want to get people to improve their work capacity, build up their strength of a certain body part, work around an injury or just help kind of get them out of pain, you need to make sure that you're matching what they need with the actual workload that you're giving them. And if you get somebody in PT and you're initially doing some lower level, like ankle strength and stability training, if they're, let's say, right after an acute ankle sprain, but if you keep on doing that same level of work, they're never going to progress back to where they were and potentially further beyond where they were before their injury. So you need to make sure that no matter what setting in PT you're in, you're appropriately challenging those people for where they are and trying to progress them past where they are to get them to reach a higher level of potential. That's a process that's always going to be uncomfortable. I think a lot of people expect once they start working out, like, oh, okay, it'll get easier. It doesn't get easier. The weights just get heavier. The exercises get harder. Yeah, exactly. You just improve your conditioning. You can do more work and it's always challenging no matter what, if you're going to push yourself enough to actually get better. Yeah. You just got to learn to love the process. (laughs) So heading into your two longer, you said it's two longer clinicals your last year, right? So did you do both of those in outpatient ortho as well? Yeah, I did. My first one was with the actual company that I would end up working with as a new grad for my first job. So they were based out of Manchester. And both of the clinics I worked in for those last two um, rotations were really good clinics. I mean, I was lucky to have good mentors while I was there, experienced clinicians who had helped me out with challenging clinical scenarios and helped me further my learning and knowledge of different like PT related topics. So I was really happy with the rotations that I did end up getting. I felt like they prepared me well for actually becoming a new grad and all the challenges that that entails. Let's head right into this. You just graduated. (laughs) Now what? 
So just graduating, you think you know everything that you need to know about PT, and then you actually start working with people like in depth, evaluating, treating them, and you quickly know, you quickly learn that you really don't know nearly as much as you thought you did. That first year of being a new grad PT, there's a really steep learning curve and you still really need a lot of mentorship, a lot of help from other clinicians who have been practicing for longer and who have experienced not only just with certain types of injuries, but actually working with people because you can have two people with the same sort of diagnosis or same sort of injury, but how you manage them and how you interact with them, it can be completely different. And that's something that you don't really think of before actually starting to work with these people in depth. More of the the bedside manner type stuff. Absolutely. Was that talked about at all in school? It was. We did have a couple of courses that were more focused on like communication, learning styles, a little bit of psychology, but you never really kind of understand the complexity of that or how in-depth it goes until you're actually kind of thrown in the ocean, have to swim for yourself, work with people. Yeah, somebody doesn't respond well to what you said. They're sitting across from you waiting for you to say something back. <laughs> exactly. And then that's when the panic sets in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I think that's, you know, anybody can relate to that who works with, with people. That's not a, that's not something that's just unique to us, I'm sure. No, for sure. I mean, anybody that works with any sort of population, you need to know how to read people, how to communicate with them and how to get your point across in a manner that will best suit that person. Yeah, I can think of dozens of examples where I totally just missed the signal or, you know, was completely off from what the person across from me was actually saying. So absolutely something that young clinicians or coaches or whatever get better with over time. Mm -hmm. Um, That's something hard to teach in school, too, because you just you need the reps. So you're, you're in your first year working as a physical therapist. You have great mentors. You're starting to recognize that, you know, you're you have to communicate differently based on the person across from you. Everybody's coming in with maybe some obstacles that you wouldn't have considered when you were in school. So what are you primarily focusing on as a clinician at this point, like moving forward? Like what are your, what are your career goals for the next several years? Yeah. So I think even when I was in PT school, I always knew that I eventually wanted to open up my own clinic that catered more towards lifters and barbell athletes, just because I feel like I'm part of that population. I can relate to them really well. And I felt like they were somewhat underserved by the medical community at large and PTs in general, just because of some preconceived notions about lifting and exercise and things of that nature. So I always knew that I wanted to open up my own thing, but I felt that I needed to, to do a lot more learning on my own and gain more experience before I actually did that so that I could kind of best serve the people that I would end up working with through my own clinic. That's not something you told them in the job interview, was it? <laughs> not the first job, <laughs> no. Hey, I want to work here. I want to get some experience, but I'm not staying for long. <laughs> no, not something that was brought up for that one because I knew that I would probably work at a couple of different clinics before I ended up opening my own thing. So, Did you? Yeah, so I, I ended up, all in all, I've worked at three different private practice orthopedic clinics before opening up my own clinic. So you started in Manchester. Where did you go after that? Uh, started in Manchester. Then I went down to Milford. I worked at Prolete Physical Therapy, which was awesome because they are definitely a little bit more focused on the lifter and athlete side of things. They were affiliated with a CrossFit gym in the area. So we got to see a lot of CrossFit athletes, a lot of weightlifters, powerlifters, things like that. Then after working there, I wanted to kind of further my career and gain more business um, education on that side of things. So I ended up taking a clinical director position all the way up in Niantic, Connecticut. Got to make the sacrifices to uh, check those boxes off, huh? Yeah, exactly. Much, much longer commute than when I was living and working both in Milford, but it was good. I learned a lot there about the business side of things, how to manage and run not only business, but people in general. So it was all the clinics that I worked at all taught me something and provided value in their own respective ways. And so 
while you're working at these clinics and you're gaining the experience that you feel is necessary with your eyes set on opening up your own clinic at some point in the future, at some point you end up working out at Revolution Fitness, right? Yeah. So I started training there a little more than a year ago and I like immediately just fell in love with the facility. It was probably the cleanest, most well-equipped gym that I've been to. And not, uh, not an ad, right? <laughs> not an ad. <laughs> not an ad. And I, I found that like the common person that would train there was a more more serious about their lifting in general. A lot of people there are either competitive power lifters or they just train really hard. They take a lot of they put a lot of focus and emphasis on their training and that type of setting really attracted me. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, Revolution Fitness Clubs is in North Haven, Connecticut, and that's where all of Resilient kind of came together, right? I was there, Paul was there, you were there. Yeah. And I'm not forgetting anybody. I, I almost felt really bad for a second. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, we went to a seminar with Claire. So Claire came on board. We knew who she was. She's yeah. very strong and was training at other gyms. But so the ball kind of got rolling at Revolution Fitness Clubs. And, you know, we were kind of offered this, we were offered access to this facility that, you know, in a day where like most gyms have three or four squat racks for, you know, a five to 10,000 member facility, Revolution Fitness Clubs has 25 squat racks for a 2,000 member facility and yeah. countless barbells, almost too many, right? We need, <laughs> we, they all end up accumulating on a rack that nobody's using. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, in the gym, I mean, there's so much specialty equipment that you can use to modify someone's training, regardless of how they might be struggling with an exercise. You can make it more accessible with any of the tools that they have in there. And so as a clinician and somebody who just loves training, like obviously this caught both of our eyes, right? We start mm -hmm. training there and, you know, it's like, couldn't imagine training anywhere else. So exactly. when you start to think about from a, your physical therapy perspective of opening up your own clinic, I can only imagine how many obstacles there are, right? If you're looking to like get your own brick and mortar place, you know, you have to have somebody for scheduling. You are definitely looking at a very high barrier to entry. So what was your plan before Revolution Fitness Clubs kind of came into the picture? Um, so initially, I had always kind of thought that I would start my business, start my clinic by setting up shop in another facility. I was usually thinking probably more like a CrossFit gym, just because I had some experience working in that model, like doing PT out of a CrossFit gym. And the CrossFit and other barbell lifters are a population who take their physical health and wellness a little bit more serious than others, I would imagine. So it's, you kind of get that population who's dedicated to actually doing what they need to do to continue to not only feel good, but perform at a high level as well. So initially when I first started at Revolution, that was kind of the path that I thought I was going to go down. I was looking at different CrossFit gyms in the area. And then uh, after a couple months of working out in the gym, my fiance, Danielle, actually was like, why don't you just try to open up your clinic in this gym? She's like, it's the perfect place. Like the people are awesome. All the equipment is really good. And it's the exact people in the exact setting that you eventually want to kind of get into. So why don't you approach them and see what happens? And the rest is history. Well, not quite, right? So I, I remember you and your brother initially sat with Jay, right? So Evan was involved or potentially involved in the beginning, right? Yes. Yeah. So my brother, younger brother, Evan and I kind of always wanted to do something together in some aspect. He's currently in school for exercise science, but with him, he actually ended up, he was in the Air Force active duty beforehand, got out, started going to school, but then he tried out for a pararescue through a national air national guard unit in new york and he was doing that while we were in the process of potentially negotiating the stuff so during this he actually found out that he was selected to become pararescue through this national guard unit and because of that that sort of training and schooling is very time and energy intensive anyways so he's gonna have to be away for weeks months at a time depending on what specific school he was going through at that point. So we figured it was best to put that aside to kind of split up in the interim and for me to kind of go with Resilient Revolution solo for now. 
Is that the ultimate goal one day to be working with your brother? Eventually that would be really cool if we can find some way to kind of get back on the same path and everything like that. So we'll have to see how that goes going forward. It's a pretty cool gig though. He's jumping out of planes and yeah, it's kind of what he's always wanted to do. So he's pretty pumped about it. Are you as much of an adrenaline junkie as he is? Uh, definitely a little bit. I, I love things like cliff jumping, going on like crazy adventures, stuff like that. But, uh, he's always, he's always wanted to go that like special forces route. So I'm really happy that he's actually now being able to take advantage of this opportunity and go for his dreams. Yeah, that's really cool. It seems like you guys are, are both doing the same thing, just, you know, in different areas. Exactly. So with opening your, your practice, what, Maybe were you not expecting? Uh, how have things gone a little bit different than what you may have initially planned? Yeah, so the probably the biggest thing that I wasn't expecting was the COVID-related gym shutdowns. Um, <laughs> also got in the way of your 500-pound deadlift. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. So I had, um, when I was working up in Niantic, I had given my boss about eight weeks notice for my resignation just because as a clinic director, I wanted to make sure that he had enough time to fill that position with somebody who was qualified. Uh, so I put in my notice two months prior to when I was planning on leaving. And then one week before the original date of my resignation is when all the gyms shut down, and everything like that. So I was kind of thrown for a little loop when that happened. I had to kind of reorganize, come up with a little bit newer game plan. And then kind of take advantage of the situation when the gyms did open back up again in mid-June. So it was a l- little bit of an inter- interruption to my plans, but overall it it went pretty well. You took one on the chin. You can yeah. say it. <laughs> well, you yeah. took it like a champ. And <laughs> here we are. <laughs> so if we backtrack a little bit, right? So you are kind of, you're exactly, maybe not exactly right. I don't want to put words in your mouth, mm-hmm. but... You said you wanted to open up your own clinic and you did it. Mm-hmm. You got the experience, you know, you have your own thing with your name on it and you decide how you operate. What do you think has changed in the way that you approach your patients or you approach treating somebody and how has your mentality as a coach or a therapist evolved since, you know, you were in that outpatient rehab center after your shoulder surgery mm-hmm. 10 years ago? Yeah. So my outlook on both physical therapy and like strength conditioning and strength training has definitely shifted quite a bit since I was first in PT school. Um, A lot of PT programs are still really focused on like different pathoanatomical models, like um, identifying the singular structural cause of somebody's pain or injury, and then using a lot of like very specific and targeted manual therapy skills to quote unquote, correct different deficiencies or like stretch out joint capsules and all that sort of stuff. So when I was first sort of treating, uh, when I got out of school, I was still somewhat more geared towards that more pathoanatomical sort of type of physical therapy. And then as I continued to read more and more and learn more and more, and as more research on the topic came out, I shifted to more of this kind of like biopsychosocial approach where not everything is just focused on one structure at fault. There's a whole ton of things that play into everybody's injuries and aches and pains. And we have to take into account various life stressors, beliefs on pain and injury, other biological things such as tissue specific injuries and things like that. So my approach has overall shifted from like a very more what we would typically think as like a rehab oriented approach and pathoanatomical approach to a a more like full person approach and really just kind of meeting people where they are, modifying what we need to, to keep them active in a way that they find meaningful and then progressing them up to where we think they need to be. Is that something that you are confident schools are doing a good job in? And I'm referring to teaching that biopsychosocial model rather than the the biological one? Yeah, I think more and more schools are shifting their curriculum to reflect what we now um, kind of model our care after. There are obviously still some schools and some curricula out there that are more or less kind of outdated in their approach. But 
as more and more of the research kind of comes out and this model is adopted by more clinicians, I'm very confident this will kind of continue to shift in a positive direction going forward. Yeah, I, re- I really hope so. Just to kind of provide a little bit more context, can you just break down what that old school mentality or that old school approach of, you know, imaging and what did you refer to it as? Bio? Uh, so initially it was more like pathoanatomic. Um, but now it's shifting more towards biopsychosocial. Yeah, let's let's explore those a little more. So one of the most kind of readily available examples of that would be um, like an example of low back pain. So before the typical route that a person would take was they would develop low back pain. More often than not, they would go see their primary care provider. And the vast majority of those people will get some sort of medical imaging. They would usually start with like an x-ray to see if there's any fractures or tumors or anything like that. And then a lot of those people would end up getting MRIs. And MRIs are incredibly sensitive pieces of technology. They can see and image a lot of very intricate details of our soft tissues. And more often than not, what you would find is when you do an MRI of somebody's low back, you would see different things like a disc bulge, herniation, stenosis, things of that nature. So what we used to think is if somebody has low back pain and you see that stuff on an image, then what is seen on the image is the cause of that person's low back pain. And that image would kind of dictate the type of treatment that they would get. So if somebody came with like a, a diagnosis of a disc injury on an MRI, then you would typically do like extension-based exercises like press-ups, standing back bends, things of that nature. And now what we're kind of coming to realize is a lot of those changes on imaging like x-rays and MRIs are very often normal age-related changes in the structures that we see in everybody. There has been a lot of studies looking at MRIs of people who are completely pain-free. And you see those changes in people as young as in their 20s. And then as they age and go through the decades of life, they just become more and more common. So we now know that you shouldn't necessarily utilize an MRI to dictate or to determine why that person's in pain or to dictate their care. It really should be saved for screening out any potential medical emergencies like fractures, tumors, cord compression, things of that nature. And on top of that, we know that a lot of pain, especially pain that's more longer term or chronic in nature, has many factors besides just what's going on from the biologic or like tissue structure standpoint. So we know that things like depression, sleep quantity and quality, nutrition, beliefs, what people tell them, whether that's friends or families or medical providers tell them, all these things kind of come in together to shape that person's pain experience. And we need to kind of meet that person where they are, educate them properly on these topics, and then come up with a plan with that person to get them back to their meaningful activities. You brought up, I mean, a lot of really important (laughs) points there, but I want to highlight two of them. Mm -hmm. One of them is that people learn from those around them. And so when it comes to the language that we use as coaches, that's why like us and everyone at Resilient Training Lab focuses so much on the narrative that we're driving. You know, when you're talking to people that are training with you, and even if it's just something like quote unquote innocent in the first session where it's like, oh, you did a lot today, you're going to be real sore tomorrow that person's going to be on high alert. They're going to wake up expecting to be sore. And if you hadn't said anything, the likelihood that they wake up and like, oh yeah, you know, my legs are a little sore, but you know, I'm going to go for a walk. And they don't even think twice about it. Now they're like catastrophizing it. Like, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I'm so sore. And then that also can go, I guess this is the same way, but another example would be like somebody whose parents have back pain. You know, if, if two people, a mother and a father are, you know, experiencing back pain and their kids are constantly seeing them limping around or like, oh, we have bad backs in this family. Everybody I know or all of our cousins and uncles have bad backs. That person's going to expect some back pain at any point in their life. And then their first instance of it, they're likely going to freak out and think it's a, it's a life sentence. Yeah. I mean, uh, a good example that I like with this is pretty much all of us have experienced a headache or two throughout some point of our lives. And typically 
you get a headache, you don't really think much of it. You might drink a little coffee and eventually it goes away and you feel good. But if you've just had like a friend or a close family member who is diagnosed with like a brain tumor and then you have a headache, you're going to be a lot more worried, a lot more concerned. It's going to affect your daily life a lot more and it might make the experience of that headache a lot worse. And that just is because of different things that happen in your life and seeing what happens to your friends and family and kind of hearing other people's stories and hearing these different things from people you know and trust. And there's so many different things that kind of shape our beliefs and our experiences that we as medical providers and coaches need to be really careful how we're shaping the people that we work with. Yeah. I mean, your words matter so much and there's a lot less black and white than I think I initially thought Mm -hmm. when I was in school and it's a lot more, a lot more gray. Absolutely. So one of the biggest shifts that you just brought up was you went from the more patho structural, what'd you say? Uh, (laughs) Pathoanatomic. There we go. I'm like, it's not biological. (laughs) So went from more pathoanatomic approach to physical therapy to that biopsychosocial model. What other shifts have you seen in yourself as a clinician throughout the years? Really doing less and less like typical rehab related interventions, um, like PT specific exercise, a lot less manual therapy, and a lot more of the activities that that person finds meaningful. So if I'm working with a powerlifter who's dealing with back pain, most of my treatment is going to be focused on variations of the big three. We're going to find some way to get that person back into the training that is meaningful to them, but in a way that's relatively comfortable. And then as they respond to that, we're going to adjust the program and progress them as appropriate. So this goes for like powerlifters, weightlifters, soccer players, everybody. You really need to kind of figure out what that person values and needs, find a way to get them to start doing it in a tolerable manner, and then progress as they progress. Now, are you willing to compromise a little bit more than you may have been early on in your career when it comes to giving the patient a little bit more of what they expect? Because like we were just talking about with back pain, expectations drive your reality. And so when a patient comes in and they're expecting to be poked and muscles stimmed and massaged into feeling better and you're like, yeah, no, you're going to have to work hard for this yourself. How do you approach that? It's tough. I mean, a lot of what I do as far as that goes is a lot of just communication with the person. I really want to educate them on what is important with these different pain conditions and injuries, what's not quite as important in what research shows that we're really doing with our different interventions. So, I mean, most research shows that pretty much anything I do with my hands, whether that's stretching or doing like a joint mobilization or any other hands-on approaches, really just causing some super short-term changes in perception of stiffness some perceptions of pain, things like that. So in those people who think that like I need to use my hands to fix them or to cause these permanent changes, like putting bones back in place or anything like that. I really make sure that I sit down, educate them that like, that's not what's happening and what actually is important to get them back to where they should be. That concept is a very far ways off from likely how the physical therapy field has been operating for decades. So do people typically respond well? Is it more about like how you talk to them, are they inherently trusting right off the bat or do a lot of people kind of question you? Yeah, it's, it's really person specific. And the best way that I can go about kind of conveying my message is to match what I'm saying to their like level of skepticism or how ready they are to hear that material. And then to find like real life examples of like the point that I'm trying to get across. So for people who think that I'm going to put their SI joint back in place with my hands or something, I'll kind of educate them or talk to them about like NFL football players and the high amounts of force and like traumatic hits that they take during during games and they come away with their skeletal structure like completely intact unless they like fracture their femur or something crazy like that. But 
really finding ways that show people that their bodies aren't as fragile and as easily changed or displaced as a lot of people think they are is what really drives it home. Because I can tell people until I'm blue in the face, that like, I'm not going to put something back in place with my hands, but if they still believe it's possible and they don't have any like real life counter to that, they're still going to believe it. Well, and at some, at some level, if they still believe that stuff, it's better for them to still be in your care and for you to kind of meet them where they're at, because at least you know where the end point that you're trying to lead them is, whereas they might, you know, if you guys butt heads and they walk out the door, there's a good chance they go find a physical therapist who's going to do exactly that. doesn't care how strong they get them or how much they progress them. And exactly, you know, that's, you know, like again, with regression to the mean, maybe they'll feel better, but at some point, like it, it they might not. So mm-hmm. um, keeping people in your, in your care, even if they're not where you'd like them to be, can be a useful tool as well. Yeah. And just like dealing with a physical injury, changing some of these belief systems and everything like that is a process. So it's for the vast majority of people, it's not like they sit down with me during their initial evaluation. We kind of go over these different myths and bits of misinformation that are very widely spread on the internet and by other people. And like, they're like, Oh, cool. Everything that I had previously thought was incorrect. I'm cool with that. And let's just go forward. Um, For most people, it's making really small adjustments or changes over time and doing your best to kind of guide them to where you want them to be gradually. Yeah. So having covered some of the things that you've improved upon as a clinician and coach over the last few I could well, I guess last decade, right? You've been kind of involved in training and coaching for a long time. Where are you going now? What are some things that you feel, you know, you you should be improving on or how are you educating yourself or continuing to learn? What are you specifically focusing on? Right now I'm I'm still really focused on learning as much as I can about pain itself because ultimately pain and what pain prevents people from doing is why they come to see me. So the more I can know about the topic, the better I can answer the, those people's questions and educate them appropriately and just really how to effectively communicate with and connect with people because having a connection between the coach or clinician and the client is likely the most important thing for getting the results that you want to get. If you can't connect with that person, you're not going to be able to impact their life in any meaningful way. Yeah. I think we see a lot of that in like, coaching as well people can become very focused on learning as much as they can about whatever training adaptations and program design but at the end of the day if you never get out in the the trenches and work with people you're not actually changing lives right so none of what you've learned is really any good until you in my opinion until you do that so exactly all right man well anything else that happened in the the story of Ryan? No, I think we just about covered it. Just starting with like the in-person coaching with Resilient and the, my clinic in the past three weeks, and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, so if you want coaching from Ryan, he is available within Revolution Fitness Clubs, very active on Instagram. Are you still posting three times a day? Uh, no. <laughs> with Between coaching and trying to get my clinic up and running as quickly as possible. I've I've been kind of slacking as far as the social media stuff goes, but I'm going to try to get more consistent with it and get back up to what I was doing before. Slacking for Ryan is like seven high value posts a week instead of <laughs> 10 or 14. So there's still some good information there. Uh, what's your, <laughs> what's your handle? Uh, it's the barbell doc. All right. So We just got to chat with the Barbell Doc for an hour. So thank you for your time, Ryan. Uh, Again, anybody interested in having more of an in-depth conversation with Ryan or wanted to follow up on anything we talked about, his Instagram handle is at the Barbell Doc. Uh, Your email is ryan.van, V-A-N-N, at Mm resilienttraininglab.com. And I'm your host, Ryan. We didn't have Paul today. We'll see him again someday in the future. Thanks for having me on, man. And thanks for listening, everybody.